Back in the era of the nobility, aristocrats believed that those of high blood should use swords in battle. To them, the sounds of blades clashing was the chorus of the lofty souls. For that reason, they were made using premium materials and masterful craftsmanship, which were then passed on for generations. The spear and bow, on the other hand, were the weapons of plebeian gladiators and commoners. After all, pitchforks and sharpened wooden poles were all that easy to have, that even the lowly citizen could make. As you may know, Mondstadt was once divided into social classes during the aristocracy period and took a toll into the city's traditions. Today, the people now live freely and uphold their Arkans' wishes. However, despite being called the city of freedom and its citizens no longer limited to their wealth and stature, it seems that their choice of weapons say otherwise. To point out, Mondstadt never got over its aristocratic biases and is still present until today. An example of this is how they continue to practice the art of the sword and claymore and disregard the other types such as bows, catalysts, and pole arms, with the latter being the least used in their nation. I figured we'd explore how this occurred and to discuss the history of weapon reputation by which many playable characters in Mondstadt are centered around the use of swords and claymores. Now I first want to credit this Reddit user for their amazing post about this topic. It never really occurred to me until I read their post and got me searching for other details for this video. To add as a disclaimer, Genshin Impact distinguishes between one-handed and two-handed weapons as swords and claymores respectively, but the lore in game doesn't because it seems that the term swords is like a broad term for a weapon with a hilt and blade, meaning that even a claymore can be called a sword in-game. Okay, without further ado, let's begin. As a guideline for what Mondstadt's attitudes towards weapons were during the aristocratic period, that is explained when we read the Royal Spear and Favonius Land stories, about a thousand years ago, swords and claymores were seen as a symbol of stature for nobles, rather than bows and ball arms. Since catalysts aren't mentioned, it's assumed they're at the middle ground in terms of prestige. From the description of the royal spear, the nobles believed that those of high blood should use swords in battle. To them, the sounds of blades clashing was the chorus of the lofty souls. As from the Favonius lands, it was once required of all nobles to study the art of the sword, that they might grow in stature and wisdom. In those days, the art of the spear was reserved for foreign gladiators and traitors. It is assumed that despite Vanessa's rebellion and the guiding principle of freedom in Mondstadt, this bias for and against certain weapon types still exists. For further proof, let's take an analysis at the aristocratic clans that still exist today. To begin with, let's look at the current playable characters from prominent aristocratic families, Diluc, Eula, Jean, and Barbara. All of them except for Barbara are sword users. Now as for why Barbara is a catalyst user, the reason lies in her parents' separation. Flashback to Jean and Barbara's childhood. Their parents, Frederica Gunhilder and Seamus Pegg, got separated and decided to take one child each. Frederica chose to take Jean, while Seamus stayed together with Barbara. This set Barbara far away from her aristocratic background and followed her father's footsteps in joining the Church of Favonius. On top of this, she doesn't even have the Gunhilder name as her noble ancestors, because her complete name is Barbara Pegg, which is from her father's name. Now according to Barbara's third character story, it was mentioned that she learned swordplay in her early age. To quote, Barbara is the complete opposite of her sister, who is seen by all as the pride of her family. Initially, all Barbara had ever wanted was to surpass her sister in at least one thing, even if only once. However, be it swordplay, her grades, or anything else, she was never able to compare. The fact that she was less competent than Jean at swordsmanship and eventually adopted the catalyst as her weapon of choice fed into her feelings of inferiority which are consistent with Mondstadt society's glorification of swords. Now, as for Diluc and Eula's lineage, 
The reason why they use swords is due to their family's history. The clan where Jilo came from was formed by Ragenvinder, a simple squire during the late aristocracy. In all his years as a squire, he watched as many citizens of Mons had suffered under the aristocrats' rule. However, he was just a lowly squire and had no voice to save them. This was until he came upon the Dawnlight Swordsmen of the Wanderer's Troop. They previously failed in their attempt to overthrow the aristocrats, leaving some of its members dead, while those who survived were punished with a fight-to-the-death situation in the gladiatorial arena. While Ragenvinder watched as this Dawnlight Swordswoman continued to fight for freedom as she died, he was inspired by her actions and later took on the name Dawn Knight in honor of her. Ragenvinder would later join Vanessa and defeat the aristocracy. As generations passed, it can be speculated that the art of the sword was inherited by Ragenvinder's descendants, which can explain why Diluc now uses a greatsword, or what we Genshin players call a claymore. The fact that their clan's use of swords was inspired by the Dawnlight Swordswoman, who is known as the Sword Dancer and uses the flute as her weapon, makes it all incredible. Now as for Eula, her Lawrence clan had a very long history in the existence of Mondstadt. At first, they didn't use swords as their prominent weapon. Instead, they were more used to using a bow and arrow. The reason for this can be read in the description of the sacrificial bow. From there it says, This bow tells the story of the pioneers and the hardships they went through. It was once the property of the proud Lawrence clan. In the past, they used it to reenact their clan's brave victory over the frozen wilderness. Over their long history, though this ceremony was lost, they continued to play the same role. But this role became corrupted and gradually, their view of themselves shifted from conquerors to overlords to kings. Apparently, the Lorenz clan once lived outside of Decarabian City and survived in the frozen wilderness as pioneers. This made them view themselves as conquerors because of how they braced the never-ending winter. When Barbato sent his people over through Decarabian and went to Cider Lake to establish the new Mondstadt, the Lorenz clan moved in with them. To show respect for Barbados, they built him a statue and their leader at that time, Venerer inscribed an oath to protect Mondstadt and its people. When Barbados left his people, the nobles at that time acted as their leaders slash protectors. This includes the Lawrence clan. On many occasions, members of the Lawrence clan would hunt as a way of showing their strength in the natural world, sharing the spoils with the people out of benevolence. Little by little, the Lorenz clan's view of themselves shifted from conquerors to kings, causing them to be power-hungry and greedy, and beginning the late aristocratic period. They abandoned their heritage of using bows and believed that nobles should only use swords. They also promoted the idea of not using spears either, considering both bows and spears as weapons for commoners and gladiators. Because their clan was paired during Vanessa's rebellion, their use of swords is still prominent in their clan, making it their primary weapon ever since, thus explaining why Eula also uses a sword as her weapon. Now to add as a trivia, in real life, swords generally haven't been the main weapons throughout history, and spears and bows were more effective. However, why were swords more romanticized in stories? Such examples were the famous Excalibur from King Arthur, Kolada and Tizona from El Cid, the Kusanagi no Tsurugi from Japanese myths, Durandal from Charlemagne, Zulfikar given by the Islamic prophet Muhammad, and many more. This is because swords were difficult to produce, are somewhat fragile, and terrifyingly effective weapons. Because of that, they were used primarily by the upper classes. This is especially true for fully armored knights, who would have to pay for the materials, labor, and maintenance of both the blade and their armor. To put it in a modern perspective, swords were like the Ferraris of the pre-industrial world. Expensive, beautiful, efficient, and the cause of envy. Spears and bows, on the other hand, are mostly made out of cheap wood and could easily be repaired and made. This made them popular to hand out to the common soldier that made up a bulk of the army. 
This is why swords are more noticed and are given names in history books and legends. All in all, spears are weapons of the common folk, cheaper to make, easier to maintain, faster to train, and has a longer reach. Give 10 men pointy sticks, and they will poke some holes on a half-trained swordsman. It can be suspected that Mons that nobles actively started a propaganda campaign against spears to discourage its mastery amongst the common folk, traders, and slaves. Now let's talk about the military significance of swords in Mondstadt. In terms of playable characters, most of those who are affiliated with the Knights of Avonius are using swords. Estimately 5 out of 9 playable knights either use swords or greatswords, especially as compared to its secondary organization, the Church of Avonius, where none of them use such weapon types. If you include Diluc, who is a former member of the Knights of Avonius, that increases it to 6 out of 10. Most Knights of Avonius members who don't use swords, with Klee as an exception, are assigned to non-combat duties, where patrolling is assigned to Amber, administrative duties to Lisa, and researching tasks to Sucrose. On the topic of aristocratic bias, all playable Knights of Avonius characters associated with aristocratic families, Diluc, Eula, Jean, and Kaya through Creepus Ragenvender are or were members of the Knights of Favonius leadership. All known armed members of the Knights' leadership have wielded or are implied to wield swords. Jean, Dilu, Kaya, Albedo, and Yulo are obvious, but even Vanessa and Varka are likely to fit the pattern. In the Gladiator's finale, we can read that Vanessa was a sword user. To quote, one battle away from being free, the Gladiator was defeated by an anonymous girl. Cries and howls burst out in the crowd like pounding thunder, but the victor refused to humiliate her opponent by execution. She refused to plunge her sword into the opponent's throat and end his life like that of a slave. As for Varka, it can be speculated that he wields a greatsword, because in Razor's third character story, it's implied that Varka came to the mountains, possibly within Wolvendom, and he teaches Razor on how to use a claymore or a greatsword. From Razor's fourth character story, one day, a tall man came and taught Razor how to swing a sword. Unwieldy though this steel claw may be, thought Razor, it was at least sharp enough to cut through tree branches. Furthermore, not only playable characters use swords, because even normal members of the Knights of Avonius have the same weapon type. Of the 21 members with in-game models, 12 are visibly armed, and those same 12 NPCs have swords. It is theorized that because the Traveler being a sword user may be a reason that they're considered trustworthy. If we were equipped with either a bow or a polearm at the start of the game, it is doubtful whether the Traveler would have been granted the title of Honorary Knight even if they defeated Devalin. This theory is probable, but there may have been some bias against the Traveler at the start, and maybe because we are literally the main protagonists of the game. Now let's explore the other weapon types and how Mondstadt utilizes them. Starting with the Outriders, who use bows and wind gliders. They were first established by Amber's grandfather, who was a mercenary from Liyue and had no discomfort against using plebeian weapons in Mondstadt. Bows and polearms were historically spoken ill of in Mondstadt as being weapons of the common folk, but that pattern actually continues on in present day Tevat. Of Mondstadt's bow users, We've already gone over why Amber's mixed nation heritage protects her from some of the shame of using a socially undesirable weapon. The others are Diona, Fischl, and Venzi. Diona is a bartender whose family has been in Springvale, a small hunting village that is considerably more rural than the main city, for hundreds of years. Fischl is an early teen who has grandiose dreams and desperately wants to stand out convincing themselves that they have hidden knowledge or secret powers. In her fourth character story, it seems that she's also the daughter of two adventurers, which is a low to middle class profession in Mondstadt. Venti is a free spirit archon who took on the image of his ruler deposing friend. None of these characters are particularly attached to Mondstadt's ideals of swordsmanship and nobility, which is why it doesn't bother them to use bows. On the other hand, we only have one Monstatian polearm user who is Rosaria. 
Now the reason she doesn't bother to use a polearm in Mondstadt can be because of her tragic past. If we read her fourth character story, Rosaria was born in a mountain village, but was taken away from her home by raiding bandits. As a young child under their supervision, Rosaria was taught how to fight, how to steal, and was made to do inside jobs for them. She had a rough childhood, where survival became her only goal. Eventually, Grandmaster Varka and the Knights of Avonius came and wiped out their bandit camp. Because Rosaria was the youngest of the bandits, Varka spared her and offered her another chance by serving at the Mondstadt Cathedral. From there, she became a sister in the Church of Avonius, but continued her old ways as a bandit. This can explain why she uses a polearm as a weapon. She sees herself indifferent to Mondstadt citizens and has no familiarity with the concept of nobility and social classes in Mondstadt. Instead, she sees a weapon as just a tool for survival and uses a polearm which she is comfortable using. Now, I guess we could also include Toma since he was born in Mondstadt, but his story is very much centered around Inazuma. Also, this part is supposed to focus on why polearms are so lacking for Mondstadt's playable characters. Now as for catalysts, the reason why they aren't mentioned is the fact that they are for obvious reasons weapons restricted to vision holders who are a far minority among the whole populace of Tevat. Looking in depth at the weapon per se, they aren't even weapons, but books or objects that carried power, symbolism, knowledge, or witnessed great individuals, and thus can be appropriated by vision holders to manipulate elemental energy in a way akin to our perception of magic. I guess the main reason why Mondstadt doesn't encourage the use of polearms is also because of the stories behind Parsifal, Engbert, and Eberhardt. Now, I would encourage you to check out our Journey to Dragonspine and Heart of Death videos, where we explored this story. As a basic summary, Eberhardt, who learned the art of the spear from a blue-eyed spear witch, manipulated Parsifal, and betrayed Ingbert to advance his own claim to nobility. While his misdeeds in Dragonspine were not discovered until the Traveler found them, it is likely that his bastard status was something of an open secret, seeing as Luther, the writer of the Ancient Investigation Journal, referred to him as Master Eberhardt and indicated that Landrick intended to legitimize him upon returning from the Dragonspine expedition. This is where the theory behind this gets a bit fuzzy. Luther indicated that Eberhardt had a kind and gentle facade, but we, the Traveler, know that he has a history of manipulation and betrayal outside of the unpublicized Dragonspine expedition. The unnamed gladiator in the Gladiator's Finale artifact set and the Blue-Eyed Spear Witch were both victims of Eberhardt's schemes, which could have been noticed by uninvolved third parties and affected their perceptions of him. I believe that his polearm use was suspected, if not outright known, by the people of Mondstadt at that time, if not the nobility. He even had a blacksmith forge the royal spear for him. Now what does this have to do with weapon prestige and aristocratic families in modern-day Mondstadt? It is speculated that the stain of Eberhardt's deeds has pushed polearms down from plebeian weaponry to symbols of poor moral character. In terms of Toma, we know from his character stories that he's half Inazuman, which likely removes the effects of Mondstadt's anti-polearm point of view, much like Amber's grandfather's influence on her perception of bows. Adding to that, he received his vision 10 years ago in Inazuma, and so he was probably around 10 plus years old when he left Mondstadt, meaning he split his childhood between two cultures. Even if Toma had been indoctrinated with a dislike of polearms in Mondstadt, the Archon of Inazuma, being a master of both sword and polearm, likely got rid of some of his doubts about them. I know that this video is only supposed to be based on Mondstadt, but I want us to also take into the different nations' perspective. First, Inazuma will have disproportionately more sword and polearm users than other categories because A was the founder of Inazuman style melee fighting. In the game, if you compare Ayaka's and Raiden's sword moveset, they resemble each other a lot. As for Liyue, I think their use of weapons are much more centered around the use of polearm, 
However, I noticed that the Milith sergeants use swords and not polearms. This was shown during a scene in the Arkhan Quest. I guess this is to distinguish between ranks among their military force. It's also interesting to note that despite the fact that there's no stigma against bow weapons in Liyue, we only have one Liyue on bow user so far. I'm guessing you already know who I meant by that. Still, it's interesting to see the newly announced characters, Shinhe and Yunjin, who are both from Liyue, use polearms. I guess polearms are just favored by the people of Liyue more than other weapon types. Now this ends my video but the social status behind weapons in Mondstadt. As a question, what do you think of having other weapon types in Genshin? We have seen that the Fatsui use guns, and some mention of boxing in Natlin. Maybe we could see that in other characters. Anyways, if you have some thoughts about the video, as well as suggestions for future ideas, leave a comment and let us know. Thank you very much for watching, and if you've hung around till the end and think it deserves one, give this video a like and hit that bell to be notified for more videos. Once again, my name is Clementine, and as usual, until the next one, be safe and stay tuned.